Jonathan Eisen is a professor uh, at the Genome Center at the University of California, Davis. He also holds appointments in the Department of Evolution and Ecology in the College of Biological Sciences and in the Department of Medical Microbiology and Immunology in the School of Medicine. And we're honored to have him as our first video guest. So Jonathan Eisen, welcome to Tools of Science. Glad to be here, or virtually be here. Yeah. So really excited to have you with us. So I'm very interested in all the things you're working on, um, but also um, because this is our first time on Tools of Science, the audience needs to know we are, we're interested in how that work gets done, the tools you use to make it happen, and then hopefully pass on some useful information that will help others doing similar kinds of work. And you have your hands on a lot of projects. So today I want to talk about two of those things. Um, metagenomics of microbial communities and also phylogenomics. And I realize they're somewhat related, <laughs> but first of all, would you define a difference between them? Well, I mean, so they're, they're actually pretty different. Um, phylogenomics uh, is a word I coined many, many years ago in response to a reviewer's uh, question, um, and it's changed in definition over the years. I think my original definition was um, not broad. So basically, phylogenomics means integrating evolutionary reconstructions with genome analysis in some way where you're not doing just one or just the other. You're trying to really mix them together in some way. So I originally used this for predicting functions of genes when you get new sequence data by building evolutionary trees, but there are lots of other things that you can do with it. And metagenomics is really um, basically going out to a community of organisms, could be you know soil sample or water sample or fecal sample or wherever else there's a collection of organisms and, and instead Instead of studying those organisms in the lab, directly studying the genomes of those organisms. So the meta basically refers to, to environment, so environmental genomics. And mostly what people do with this is, is grind things up and sequence them. Yeah. Okay. So let's start, let's start with metagenomics. So it sounds like a simple analogy would be metagenomics is who are all the people that live in that building? And phylogenomics could be, how are they all related to each other? Yeah, that a fair, basically. Fair way I mean, to say it. Sounds good. It's a little simple, but um, so what kinds of metagenomics things are you working on currently? Yeah, so um, we do two things that I would say relate to metagenomics. Um, one is actually studying specific communities of microbes and you know, we study a lot of different communities of microbes. So if you, you know, asked me which one we're studying today, it might might be different than last week. And, you know, I have a lot of students in the lab and a few projects that don't, don't involve students. So it all depends on what they're working on. I have a student working on frogs and their microbes. I have a student working on koalas. I have a student working on fish. We have many students working on rice and seagrass. And, you know, so it, it it all depends on the project and the person. But the second thing that we do is develop the methods to analyze the data that comes out from metagenomic projects. So if you go out to any environment, grind up the sample, and you extract the DNA, and you run DNA sequencing reactions on that DNA, because DNA sequencing is so cheap today, you get a lot of data. And yeah. that's, you know, revolutionary, right? You can learn a lot about a community, but the computational analysis of that data is complex, to say the least. So we work on the methods to analyze that data, and largely we work on phylogenomic methods to analyze that data. Okay. So I, I have to ask, let's take the koala. Why? Yeah, so I have a graduate student, um, Katie Delhausen, who 
became very interested in koalas in part because there's this big chlamydia epidemic going on in okay. Australia in the koala populations, and many koalas are getting sick from this. And then when a koala gets injured or brought into a rehab clinic, they pump them, them full of antibiotics to try and make them better. Okay. Um, but the effects of those antibiotics on the koala health are unclear and may be pretty damaging because the koalas depend upon microbes to help them digest their eucalyptus okay. food. So she's, she actually did a Kickstarter campaign to raise money um, to fund some of this work and then went to Australia where she has a collaborator and spent a few months there basically working at a koala rehab clinic and collecting samples for microbiome studies associated with that project. And so the goal there is to define the microbiome of the koala based on what's living in their gut? Well, so, you know, um, just because DNA sequencing is cheap today doesn't mean that nobody has studied microbiomes of any particular system before. So there, okay. there's a lot known about koalas and their microbes, but you can, you know, learn more if you do additional sequencing because it's gotten cheaper because there's a lot of microbial diversity there. And what, what she's really interested in is not um, you know, just characterizing what's there, but understanding the effect of antibiotics on mm -hmm. the microbiome and, you know, some other details about the treatment and rehabilitation of the koalas. And so the DNA sequencing is, in essence, a, a diagnostic of the microbial community. So it will tell us about who is there. But really what she's interested in is how does it change over time in response to the particular treatments. Right. So it's a shift in the population distributions within the gut? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, within poop. Uh, yeah. So, um, and, you know, that's basically similar to many other projects that are going on in my lab and around the world, which is that, you know, we know about microbes in many systems on the skin and guts and leaves and roots of lots of different organisms and there's even been you know microbiome related work on many of these that is a microbiome, microbiome is a community of organisms but because dna sequencing is so cheap you can now do much finer scale time series or um, detailed comparisons between different health states or between between different um, environmental conditions and so that's sort of the area that a lot of metagenomics is being used for now is not just the discovery part of characterizing a community, but the characterization of how it might change in response to some genetic factor or environmental factor or behavioral factor or disease factor or so on. Right. Okay. So let's go back then, then to the data methods that you're talking about, because this is the part that... Um, you know, I, I can understand all the different sequencing technologies, but I, I don't even know enough about the data analysis to be dangerous. But it's, it, it, it's a phenomenal thing to me to figure out when you're getting millions and millions of sequence fragments, and I realize many of those line up, and that can be done for you, but still there's a lot left to be analyzed. How does that happen, or, or how, how are you working on making that easier? Yeah, so a, a lot of what I sort of think about and, and worry about is is exactly your question. How do you make that easier and how do you make it work better? And so if you think about the approach that we take, you know, there's lots of great work that's out there on how to analyze this type of data. It's been very hot or popular. So there are you know, hundreds of bioinformatics labs designing tools. It's the the thing that we're different about maybe than many of those is we focus on an evolutionary approach to analyzing the data. And in addition, an evolutionary approach to planning the data sets that you need to analyze the data. And I'll, I can tell you quickly about both of those. So if you get tiny little sequence fragments from an environmental community and you want to know a simple question, 
who is out there in the community. And you have random pieces of the genomes of organisms in the community. In, in my, my, you know, experience, uh, the best way to do this is to build evolutionary trees based upon those sequences where you compare the sequence to all the relatives that you can pull out of that sequence in any database anywhere, especially if you have information about it. So these days, most of that data, if you want to know something about the organism that it came from, is coming from genome projects. Okay. That, you know, the vast majority of sequence data for any particular gene is going to be coming from a, a genome. And so we would take, take a sequence and basically build an evolutionary tree of that, that sequence compared to its home logs, just, just like you would do this with a piece of bone that you find at a fossil site, right? You find a okay. tiny little bone and some dig in, you know, the middle of Montana and you say, what, what did this come from? You line it up with the other bones from, you know, obvious relatives, let's say mammals, and, you, you know, you try and figure out where that bone sits in the tree of mammals. It's, but even if you don't have a complete skeleton, you can figure out that that bone came from organism X. Okay. And we do the same thing with sequences. We just line up the sequence with relatives of that sequence. Now, of course, you can't do it by eye because there are 200 million relatives of that sequence. So we need to design computational methods to do that. And then we build an evolutionary tree of that sequence. And again, because we're analyzing so much data, you can't look at the evolutionary tree. <laughs> um, yeah. You have to automated methods to scan through through the output and and then you can say my sequence number one is most closely related to bacillus anthracis the causative agent of anthrax or yeah. is most closely related to e coli and then you do the same thing for sequence number two and three and four until 100 million it's easy and no uh, it's it's a lot of compute time and it doesn't always work perfectly well but that's basically what we're doing is trying to get a picture of the total diversity of a sample based upon analyzing the fragments of sequences from that sample. So when you say a fragment of sequence, that means, you know, a couple hundred base pair read, and you're doing that for each one, not as a group, group because you, you, at this point, yet haven't figured out who sits next to who in a single genome, right? You're looking at... Yeah, I mean, so we... I think there are many uses to analyzing just the raw data because it sort of approximates the relative abundance of the organisms in the sample. And if you take the raw data and you try and stitch it together into big assemblies of the genomes, that can be incredibly useful for many purposes. But, um, but the raw data is also useful for counting organisms and assigning things to taxonomic groups especially if you have uh, more than 100 base pairs. So, you know, these days when people do Illumina sequencing from an environmental sample, they're probably going to do paired end. So you get pairs of sequences where you get 250 base pairs from each end. And if you make a small insert, you can get them to overlap with each other. So you get a 500 base pair. Right. For many genes to say what kind of organism it came from. Okay. And so the other thing that you need to do is build up your reference information to know which genes to look for in the data. Not all genes work for this. So you need to know which genes to look for, just like with bones, right? I mean, just like with a skeleton, the the humerus bones are really useful, but the wrist bones, you have no idea what they are. Okay, so, yeah. Um, or a jawbone would be... Yeah, yeah, a jawbone for a human would be awesome, or you know, something in that group, but, you know, other bones would not be that useful. So you, you need to... So we spend a lot of time analyzing genome data to figure out which genes are useful markers okay. for what organism is there, and then... I also spend an enormous amount of time and effort to try and gener generate reference genome data across the tree of life. Because if you get a little fragment of sequence from a phylum of bacteria that you have no data from, 
you can't place that sequence into that group. So I've been running projects for 15 years now to try and ensure that we have broadly sampled genome data in order to then better interpret the environmental data. Right. So that's where the phylogenomics and the metagenomics overlap, right? Is well, they that... both they overlap in the sequence. Building these trees of sequences is phylogenomics in my mind because we're doing it across the genome. And, yeah. and then phylogenomics can also tell you where are there gaps in our genome data. So if you build an evolutionary tree of organisms and then you overlay onto that tree, you know, which organisms have genome sequences, you can figure out which branches don't have genome sequences. Yes. And then fill that in. So I ran a project at um, my previous job at Tiger, the Institute for Genomic Research, to do this. And then I co-ran a project at the Joint Genome Institute called the Genomic Encyclopedia of Bacteria and Archaea, where we did this for yeah. cultured organisms. And now cultured organisms represent a tiny fraction of the total diversity of life. So we're now, we and other people are now doing that for getting genomes from uncultured organisms in order to fill in the tree. Exactly. So you're going exactly where I wanted to go with that. So um, how, how, do you, how do you get those genomes from uncultured organisms? I, I guess going back, how do I even identify? I mean, you must get fragments sometimes and say, this doesn't fit anywhere even close to any part of the tree we already have. Is that true? Sure. Um, when uh, shotgun sequencing of environmental samples first got really started in early 2000s, I was working with Craig Venter on analyzing his data set from the Sargasso Sea. Okay. It was the first sort of big scale Sanger sequencing from a big community of organisms, at least that we had. There were other people doing this from other samples, but we didn't we didn't know about that at the time. And that's the first thing I did. The first thing I did was with scan through the data to look for sequences that didn't branch inside, you know, the major branch branches in the tree of life that were weird and outside it. And we found some. And then we couldn't convince ourselves that it was real. And then a couple of years later, we scanned through a new data set that Venter had also generated from sailing around the world and sequencing samples. And the same thing happened. We found sequences that couldn't be put into the bacteria, archaea, or eukaryotes, the three domains of life. And we couldn't figure out what to do with it. And then. Four years after that, I finally realized we should at least report this um, somewhere. And so we wrote a paper on this saying, you know, we don't know what these are. They could be from viruses. They could be, you know, mistakes in sequencing. They could be poor phylogenetic analysis. Um, but, you know, they could be novel organisms that are out there. And other, you know, I, I don't know... How, if you're familiar with it, but there was just a really big paper that came out from Jill Banfield's lab at Berkeley called The New Tree of Life um, that came out a couple weeks ago. And they have assembled genomes from uncultured samples for 1,000 genomes or so from okay. uncultured organisms. And a huge fraction of them branch, they're, they're bacteria, but they're bacteria that are distantly related from any known bacteria that have been characterized previously. And they were completely missed by all previous studies of environmental samples. So I don't think we found, you know, a fourth branch on the tree of life. I think what we probably found was bacteria that weren't grouping inside the previously known groups of bacteria, maybe like what, what they found. But there's weird, weird stuff out there I'm in, so sure. in many environments. and you know, it's it's hard to, it's easy to analyze things that are closely related to known things. The bioinformatics is a lot easier. As you get more and more distant from known things, the bioinformatics gets harder and harder. And so one of the reasons we want to have all of these reference genomes from across the tree is it will allow us to better 
find things in environmental samples and say what they are and also say, here's a few things that don't group into the known groupings. Yeah, yeah that's exactly, that's where my curiosity goes. So now I, I realize that somebody else did this work, but I'm guessing you can help me out. So how, how do they get those genomes, not just fragments, yeah. from uncultured specimens? Well, so we, uh, I've been collaborating with people who are doing uh, their own approach to doing this. So after we did the Genome Encyclopedia at the Joint Genome Institute, the Joint Genome Institute launched a uncultured genome encyclopedia run by Tanya Wojcicki there. And they went about getting genomes from uncultured organisms by sorting cells. So flow sorting until you get like a single cell in a microtiter well, and then doing whole genome amplification with this sort of rolling circle amplification process. Okay. And you can get a lot of the genome from a single cell and then feed that into genome sequencing methods. Okay. And they uh, did a project on that that I sort of was a peripheral collaborator. And then we have a new grant with her and this person, Ramona Stefanoskis, at the Bigelow Lab in Maine to do the same thing but from more environments. But what Jill did is really different. They figured out how to assemble genomes from metagenomic data to get, you know, it's not hard to do this with abundant organisms because you get a lot of overlapping reads right. and you can stitch together large contigs with standard sort of genomic methods. What they figured out how to do was to do it with less abundant organisms. And they're just incredibly good at really hard bioinformatics from uh, these samples. They basically take a lot of information, like they do assemblies, however big they can get them, and then they take the contigs and they annotate, they analyze the contigs to find GC content and, and to find phylogenetic marker genes, track as they co shift across different samples. If they're from the same organism, they should have the same relative abundance as each other across different samples. Uh, yeah, okay. So, so they use all sorts of interesting methods to try and tease apart the data. And they've managed to get, you know, thousands of nearly complete or complete genomes from many of these environments. And here's the amazing thing for their environments that they were looking at, and for some of the ones that we've been looking at, there are organisms in there that are really distantly related from the other known bacteria. And there, you may or may not know, one of the methods that many people use to look at environments is ribosomal RNA PCR amplification yep. with universal primers. Yeah, thank you. Tell me more. I mean, <laughs> So for, um, you know, since PCR was invented, uh, many people have been using PCR to get ribosomal RNA genes from environmental samples. And th there are many reasons for this. It's a good phy phylogenetic marker. Um, it's present in all cellular organisms. There are regions that are highly conserved at the ends of the genes that can serve as PCR primers. Um, and, you know, it became the marker for microbial studies. And it turns out the PCR primers are, you know, the regions are conserved, but not absolutely conserved. Mm -hmm. And so some organisms don't amplify with those primers. It turns out hundreds of major branches in the tree of life don't amplify with those primers. And so they showed that if you look at the genomes that they got from these samples, the ribosomal RNAs in those genomes don't match the primer sites. And they have other weird things about them that would make them hard to PCR or amplify. So ribosomal RNA PCR is amazing. It's an incredibly powerful tool to characterizing a microbial community because you can get it from tiny, small samples, and you can sequence just one gene from each organism instead of the whole genome and get an idea as to what it is. So you, you need a lot less sequencing from a sample to, to use it. But it is imperfect. 
Yeah. It, and that's fine. It's still amazingly powerful. It's just incomplete. Okay. Yeah, that's – there are so many questions around how all this gets done. So I would have never thought, for example, to compare the abundance of different fragments – to say this came from the same organism. Like it, yeah, if one I mean, fragment it, shows up a lot, you, it couldn't possibly have come from the same source. I mean, I, it's, it's, it's really cool. I confess, um, we actually put in a mini grant proposal to do this many years ago, and it was rejected as being impossible. Um, but the people who developed the method really did an amazing job with it, way better than we could have done. And it works really, really well. So let's go back to the flow sorting for a second. So the question going through my head on that is, so you're, you're flow sorting to single cells, and then is there any selection beyond that? Is there any way to identify which ones you should pick, or you're just taking them and knowing, all right, we're going to amplify from all these different single cells, but we know we'll get a lot of well, them. Well, go back to what we were just talking about, ribosomal RNA. So you, so you do two things to make this work better. You go to a lot of environments, or at least this is how um, Tanya Wojcicki and, and Ramona Stepanoskis, my collaborators, are doing it. And um, you go to a, a lot of environments, and you just do, without flow sorting, you do ribosomal RNA, PCR, and sequencing. And because we have amazing data from ribosomal RNA, you can tell from that data if there are organisms in your sample for which we do not have genomes. And you can even tell, are there whole, whole organisms that represent very novel lineages that we don't have genomes for the whole branch? So they went around and they ranked different environments by the fraction of that environment that contained interesting stuff. And, and um, so that gives you a sample to go after where you're more likely to find something novel. Yeah. And so... Um, and then what you do is you do flow sorting in that environment and you take the hopefully single cells in each well or in each microfluidic device and you do ribosomal RNA sequencing on each of those. And now you know which well contains the novel organisms. Right. And then you do genome sequencing from those. So there's two, two steps of enrichment. Going to yeah. the place where everything's new yeah. and then ribosomal RNA to throw out what, what isn't. And of course, that means that you're not going to do single cell sequencing from organisms that are novel but have weird ribosomal RNA. We missed by this. Yeah. So we are now looking into other ways to determine how novel a particular cell is in one of these wells. Maybe using PCR of other genes or a little bit of random sequencing, et cetera. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the sequencing itself. So it sounds like most of what you're doing is based on Illumina-type sequencing? Um, no, actually. I mean, okay. So if you want cheap sequencing and a lot of it, Illumina is the way to go. But um, in some studies that we've been doing in my lab, we've uh, used a lot of pack bio sequencing because you get longer reads and that makes it easier to stitch together your genomes. Right. Um, we've also experimented with these pseudo long read methods like Molecula and 10x genomics uh -huh. and a few other things where you use Illumina sequencing but you make a really smart library so it tells you which pieces are nearby in the genome. Right. Um, and I'd like to do, you know, minion sequencing. We, we haven't had one, but hopefully we'll get one of them. So, you know, long reads are really, really useful. Yeah, that's what I would have assumed. I guess, you know, I hadn't seen anything, that, and, but I'm not sure I was looking at more recent stuff from your lab. So when you're deciding, how do you decide, you know, this is worth putting on a packed bio machine or... Or we're going to do this on an Illumina. Is there? A you guess. No. Yeah. Um, you, uh, so I mean, I think a lot of it depends on the complexity of your system and what your goal is, right? So if your goal is to assemble genomes from your system, and 
you have a low diversity system, you can probably do a lot of it with Illumina because, you know, the assemblies will work pretty well if the system is non-diverse. Okay. But as you get to more complicated systems, if you want to assemble the genomes of the middle organisms from those samples, you would have to do, you know, a lot of Illumina sequencing and it probably still won't work that well. Right. Whereas pack bio sequencing, which is more expensive per base, does allow you to get longer fragments. Even if you don't get an assembly, you would have a 20,000 base pair fragment where you could ask questions about co-localization of genes or, you know, can I find a cluster of antibiotic synthesis genes or um, antibiotic resistance genes? So it it's all should be driven by the goal of the project. And then you've got to work backwards from your goal and say, okay, is, is there any way I could imagine doing this with cheap sequencing? Well, then do that. Right. <laughs> um, and if not, then you've got to do other things. But computation, it sounds like, is part of the equation then. So you have to think about where's the tipping point where yeah. I can get the data cheaper, but it's going to cost me the bank to, to put it all together, or I can spend more money on getting a different kind yeah, of data. Bio data is easier to analyze in one sense because it's more like genome data. It's harder to analyze because it has a lot of errors. So, you know, it's, you have to include the cost of labor and time in there as right. well as the cost of the actual data generation. Well, that's, yeah. So th this is really helpful. I mean, it's, it's just kind of the things that I wonder about, and it's really sort of the purpose of this site is to help people understand those decisions if they're trying to do this kind of work. work. So I want to wrap up. I'm going to ask you a crazy question about phylogenomics. Um, and so I have an interest in geology. Yeah. And I think about um, the history of the Earth, and I realize that the history of life on Earth is a small fraction of the total history. But when I think of an evolutionary tree of microbes, do you ever look at that and ask, you know, can you look and say, this is the thing that distinguishes this branch from the previous branch functionally, and see these leaps? And I realize we're looking now as they live in their yeah. environments today, not a hundred million years ago. But I, what I want, my fantasy is to look at the tree and go, this is what life was like at the point those things diverged. Well, I mean, that, I mean, that is basically the origin of the term phylogenomics. That's what I was doing. Yeah. So I was trying to figure out the history of functions across the evolutionary tree of life. I, I was working on a particular group of functions related to DNA repair and mutation processes, but what I wanted to know was basically what the ancestors were like. And when I did that, it turns out that not only can you predict what the ancestors were like, but you can predict where the changes happened in the tree and that's really important because when you have a branch in the tree for which you have no data, you can then predict what that organism or that gene is like by where it sits in the tree. I'm going to have to think about that one, honestly. I could nod my head, but... <laughs> well, so, so let me make the analogy again back to fossils. You can, okay. If you got, you know, fossils from some dinosaur from you know 50 or 60 million years ago and you placed it on the tree of dinosaurs if it was on the branch leading up to birds with archaeopteryx and other you know bird like dinosaurs even if you didn't have wings for it even if you didn't have the right things for it you could predict what its biology was like by where it sits on the tree okay and that's the same thing with microbes the same thing with Genes, the same thing with any other type of organism. You can not only reconstruct what was like what it might have been like in the past, but that helps you pre predict uncharacterized parts of the tree. Okay. So my dream is not totally crazy that we could look at the tree and understand the biology of things that we we don't even know about in detail yet. And I hope it's not crazy. I just taught it to 700 students at UC Davis. So. Okay. Excellent. And then
infer from that some environmental change or a shift in their location or something. And it doesn't have to be perfect. I just, yeah, that's what I work on. I mean, I yeah. do things like this. It's the farther in the past you go, the harder it gets, but it's still fun. Yeah. Well, it's fantastic. So Jonathan Eisen, I want to thank you very, very much for one, taking the time on a Saturday morning to answer with my kids playing questions. in the background. Okay. Yeah, well, I got rid of my kids for an hour, but anyway, um, I really appreciate this.